them for the kingdom of God, that they might be an end time people of God proclaiming his salvation throughout the earth. The issue of Israel, which is the issue of the nations. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mark Lafter. Today we will be speaking with Art Katz, who since he was saved in Jerusalem in 1964, has been an apostolic and prophetic presence in the body of Christ and around the world. Since 1975, he has lived in northern Minnesota, where he was specifically sent to establish a community, a refuge, and an end-time teaching center named Ben Israel. In that setting, and along with many others, Art has sought to articulate and to live out the great themes of the faith, principally the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How that cross dovetails with other great mysteries and revelations of the last days will be the focus of this three-part series. Specifically, in our first episode, we will ask how the cross of Christ, the centrality of the cross of Christ, and the centrality of the nation of Israel both coexist in God's cosmic design. In our second episode, we will ask how the cross of Christ interfaces with the coming time of Jacob's trouble, a time of great tribulation for both Israel and the church. And in our final episode, we will examine what the cross of Christ means in the light of the mystery of the reciprocal relationship of Israel and the church. Art will describe how God has woven the destinies of the two together inextricably in suffering and transfiguration. Art, we hear reports daily coming out of Israel of terror, mayhem, and dire straits for that nation. What is the church? How is the church to view this? Well, I'm sure there's much disappointment in those in the church that have hoped for a successful Israel to see this increase of calamity and even a threat to the very existence of the state. And uh, my heart goes out to those who uh, experience this kind of anxiety and apprehension. But I think I have to say that it needs to, the church needs to brace itself for yet worse reports. My, um, fi my ultimate conviction is that we should brace ourselves even for the failure of present Israel and that, in fact, God intends that failure, and that the establishment of the state is not the fulfillment of the prophetic destiny of that people, as we had thought, which was originally my own uh, first understanding. But as events have unfolded, and the uh, scenario of uh, devastation and violence increases, I, I see in Scripture indication that God has established a preliminary to that great and ultimate fulfillment through which Israel itself must pass and cannot be exempt. So, what shall we say? That um, we are disappointed, Israel is disappointed in itself, for the establishment of the state was not just uh, a political uh, hope or provision, but that we would be an example to all nations of the kind of unique uh, state that Israel would be, that it would encompass or express what we thought were our moral distinctives and righteousness, but alack and alas, as our dilemma and uh, extrem extremity requires, we are acting as every other state has acted in its own self-preservation, and even in ways that we thought Jews would never act. The employment of violence, the justification for torture of suspected terrorists, even actual terrorists, have um, compelled us to a line of conduct that seriously questions our moral uniqueness. And I believe that that's all in God's intent because we have never subscribed to what uh, we think is a Christian doctrine of human depravity or the innate 
sinfulness of man, and uh, we are the perennial optimists and humanists that celebrate man, particularly Jewish man, I think we have to learn in the hardship of our experience what the scriptures all along would have told us, that there's no man good, no not one. And that such a venture as a prophetic fulfillment of Israel's destiny cannot be accomplished by man, however well-meaning, and that it is, in the last analysis, it's God's own great work. So, if Jesus were here now, he would say to the church something of the kind that he addressed to his disciples uh, after his own death and resurrection to those that were disillusioned and crestfallen that had hoped that he had, would be the uh, answer to their messianic expectation. He said, fools, oh fools and slow of heart, not to believe all that the prophets have written. Ought not the Messiah to have suffered and died before he ascends to his glory. So there's a remarkable parallel between the issue of Israel and its prophetic fulfillment and that of the Son of God before it. There's a suffering that precedes the glory and that we are slow of heart to believe for. We have no stomach to understand the necessity for that kind of preliminary. And I think our problem is we have not the kind of jealousy for the glory of God that is becoming and appropriate to the church. To desire the success of a state is not the same as desiring the glory of God that can only come through a much greater fulfillment that must necessarily be preceded by disappointment, failure, suffering, and the rest. Art, in what context should we understand God choosing Israel to be so central to all the nations? What is the purpose and what function does Israel perform for the nations? Well, I don't think that there's any proper understanding of the issue of Israel except in the context of the nations. This was our destiny from the first as a partic particular and peculiar witness of God to the nations. We were chosen for that purpose, to make God known as he would be exemplified and shown through our own conduct, our own covenant faithfulness to the God who has called us. And of course, we have been an abysmal failure in that regard historically. But it, uh, the chosenness has to be seen in the theocratic, theocratic context of God's intention, namely that there's a kingdom that shall prevail and the rule of which shall go forth to all nations. And only then will they beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and study war no more. So the great text in Isaiah chapter 2 is that the law shall go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. The church has spiritualized this away historically and uh, has robbed the literal significance of Israel's destiny. So therefore, not, as it, not only is it unknown to Israel, it's unknown to the church, and yet is at the center of God's great intent. That there's a rule that must go forth out of the place that God has appointed, and he has chosen Zion, not because it's preeminent or impressive, in fact, all the more because it's not. He's not chosen Israel because it is impressive, all the more because it's the least of all peoples. And so there's a mystery here of God's chosenness that must be fulfilled because the issue of the God who chooses is the issue of God. And so Israel is at the vortex of the issue of God before all nations. And uh, the powers of darkness know this better than the church and will do everything within the realm of its own power to defeat this design from obtaining fulfillment. And therefore, we will understand how that couples with the last day's opposition to Israel itself, even to the point of an annihilation of that people, rather than there should be a fulfillment. We read in Acts 20, 3.21, for example, that the Lord is contained in the heavens, waiting for the restoration of all things spoken by the prophets since the world began. The church, again, has misappropriated that verse thinking that it, put, that it refers to itself. The prophets had no thought but that of Israel, that there were things that needed to be fulfilled for Israel's own destiny that has to do with the coming of the king. This is why Jesus said, you'll not see me again until you shall say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He is contained in the heavens, which is to say, he's imposed upon himself a restriction. He cannot come down 
into the place of his kingship, the very city where he was crucified, and over his head the ironic statement in three languages, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, he cannot be that king until there's a people restored to the land, restored to their God, restored to him, that will be the fulcrum for the theocratic glory that is to issue from the place of God's own choosing, namely Zion. Uh, Adolf Safir, a great uh, Hebrew Christian preacher uh, in England in the uh, 1800s, he said, it is the duty of every minister of Christ to explain the mystery of Israel. It is a part of our holy religion. It belongs to the counsel of God. It is inseparably connected with the truth as it is in Jesus. There can be no true and full preaching of the gospel without explaining the mystery of Israel. What aspect of the genius of God is Safir describing in his conjoining of the proper preaching of the gospel and the mystery of Israel? And how has this omission, of the omission of this mystery in contemporary preaching, truncated and diminished the gospel today? What shall we do to correct this situation? Wow. <laughs> That's an enormous question, and it is the question. Paul speaks of it as the mystery in Romans 11. I would not have you to be ignorant of this mystery, brethren, lest you become wise in your own conceit. Paul was a steward, an apostolic steward of the mysteries of God. And of course, mystery does not mean a detective story. It means something hidden, concealed in the deepest purposes of God, to be revealed and to be fulfilled at the time of his own choosing. And Paul warns the church that there's a consequence of a great kind if they should forsake the knowledge of this mystery. Because it's not only the issue of Israel's call, it's the issue of the church's call. The two are so inextricably joined that neither the one nor the other can find fulfillment independent of the other. So a church that has uh, discarded this mystery or uh, rejected it will suffer the consequence that Paul warns. It will become inflated in its own conceit. And I think that that is directly connected with the bombast and the hyper expression of our contemporary church, even in its best charismatic forms, the kingdom now, or we are the kingdom, or we are the Israel of God. All of the presumption, presumptuous bombast that celebrates the church at the expense of Israel disfigures the church and fails the, in the church's recognition of its relationship to Israel, alone by which it can come to the fulfillment of God's own intention. Well, I know that I'm speaking a mouthful myself, and that even heightens the word mystery. Mystery requires a revelation for its understanding, and therefore no amount of uh, human or intellectual effort is going to glean it. It's something that needs to be communicated by God, but it requires a condition from the church that is hospitable to the receiving of mystery, namely a disposition of spirit that is humble and contrite. If we are self-exalted and bumptious and arrogant in our own claims and contentions, then we ipso facto, by that very fact, disqualify ourselves from the receiving of the mystery. So perhaps we'll come back to this, and I'll just repeat myself to say that we have paid as the church a remarkable price in the forsaking of a mystery that the apostle has instructed us that we should not be ignorant. And my prayer is, of course, that in these last days, we will seek and find <clears throat> what has been historically lost to us, because it's not only the key to Israel's fulfillment, it's the key to our own. Yes, it seems like you're describing the dangers of the church embracing replacement theology or the, or the two covenant theories. Doesn't that, embracing those theologies really destroy the centrality of the nation Israel? Absolutely. And in fact, it is the expression of uh, the conceit of which Paul warns that we would substitute ourselves for Israel. And of course, the, the scriptures almost seem to invite that interpretation unless we are in a proper disposition toward God and the veil can be taken from our own eyes and our own understanding as the church. So there's a remarkable complex thing that there's a blindness over the eyes of Israel with regard to its own understanding of God and its destiny, and a kind of comparable blindness over the eyes of the church that needs to be revealed. I think that uh, much of the problem is, is the church's failure to identify itself properly as being 
in conjunction and connection with this Israel and not some kind of autonomous innovation that has come later in New Testament times that is something other than the Israel of God that to which Gentiles have been called by the grace and mercy of God because salvation then and always is of the Jews. Art, it might be useful just to take a little look at uh, church history uh, in this overall perspective. Uh, Adolf Safir has uh, spoken about the medieval church did not possess much in the way of gospel light and the Refor Reformation church did not possess sufficient prophetic light. Uh, we know that over the history of the church there was a lot of darkness. Even the, in the Reform We needed the Reformation to understand justification by faith. Uh, it took 14 centuries for that to come out. It's not surprising in a sense that uh, the mystery of Israel has not been seen in, and acknowledged until these days. As a matter of fact, you have said it is not uncommon to have to wait for an understanding of a prophetic text until we come closer to the time of its fulfillment. Are we at that time? Absolutely. And in my own understanding, that uh, has been my experience uh, with the first intifada and the first throwing of stones, something was signaled in my own spirit that this is the beginning of the end of the present state of Israel. I couldn't document that at that time, but I think that subsequent events more and more indicate uh, the terrible uh, tragedy and uh, increasing sense of hopelessness and futility that is coming to the uh, nation through that which began with the mere throwing of stones by children. But something was triggered in my spirit that this is the beginning of the end, that Israel is being brought to a final uh, sense of um, inability in itself to resolve its own difficulties. And that necessarily has to be the case. Maybe I, I understand that more than others being Jewish, because we Jews in our own estimation and in that of others, have always been so resourceful a people that we can even come out of the Holocaust with a tattooed number on our arms and hardly anything more than a ragged uh, prison uniform and within a decade we're prospering. Well, the very history of the state of Israel itself is another exemplification of that human resourcefulness. We are man and we are human self-sufficiency independent of God. And of course, that's a contradiction in terms. However, God himself would desire to see us finally in a place of security. It will not be on the basis of our own proficiency or self-sufficiency, but on the basis of our relatedness to a God who, whose grace enables our establishment in the land. So everything is calculated to bring us to a place where the insurmountable difficulties are beyond our Jewish ability to resolve. Because the issue of Israel, I'm repeating myself, is the issue of man. And we are a witness nation, both to our anthropology and to God. We're a statement to the world that you cannot succeed independent of this God. And God has been excluded from the consideration of the world. He's a Sunday addendum, but he's not brought into the serious consideration of men and of nations. And therefore, we suffer the consequence that we must in that God rejection. Israel has got to illustrate that truth to all the world. Unbeknownst to itself, it is serving that purpose and that destiny. So the church, rather than upbraiding Israel for its failure, needs to understand that it's a failure that must necessarily come. It's a failure of man to succeed in himself independently of God. Yes, Israel might make allusion to prophecy that is fulfilling prophecy, but effectually, we're talking about an atheistic nation that is secular, socialistic, and Zionistic, humanistic, seeking to establish itself. And the scant references to prophecy are only a cosmetic uh, employment and are not really a confidence in the God of the prophets. So uh, we need to understand the drama that is being acted out before us that does not invite us to censure Israel for its failure, but to understand how painful that failure must necessarily be, but that it is necessary. And out of the final failure and collapse will come God's resurrection answer. Jesus exemplified that at the cross. The disciples themselves were heartbroken. Alas, we had thought it had been he, but here he is, a dead cadaver. And so we're going to come to a similar recognition of Israel. Alas, we had hoped that this might succeed. It came within a hair's breadth of succeeding, and then at that very moment, 
even in Jesus at the uh, apogee, the height of his human fulfillment as son of God, becomes then the terribly shattered human wreck at the cross and defeats the hope of his own disciples. And out of that defeat and out of that abandonment, out of which he himself cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, comes the great resurrection answer of God, which is to say, the glory of God. And I believe that if we will hold tight, we will see the same enactment of the issue of Israel, for it is required to walk in the footsteps of its own Lord and fulfill a same road to Calvary and exhibit to the world the power of God alone that redeems and establishes and restores, not as an, a, an accomplishment of men, but as the revelation of his mercy, goodness, and power. Isn't that a key to understanding uh, Israel's centrality, that it must, as you just referred, walk that road to Calvary. It must be the suffering servant nation, just as its Messiah was the suffering servant. Absolutely. It's interesting that the rabbis have often claimed that interpretation for Isaiah 53, that the suffering servant is Israel, called to be a servant. And of course, we have to acknowledge that there's sufficient grounds to read that into that text. But I believe that the greater fulfillment of that text is yet future, when Israel, like the Lord before it, shall have no beauty that any might desire it. It shall be stricken and uh, marred more than any man, more than any nation. So shall nations and kings be astonished at the sight. I think that that's yet future. And Israel is taking the first steps toward that kind of abasement and humiliation so that by its own suffering, it might begin to recognize the suffering of him who had preceded them and, who, and uh, whose suffering has been ignored as a non-fact by Israel itself. So that the crucifixion of Jesus has been uh, ironically set aside for, by Jew, in Jewish consideration. The text is not even read in synagogues in uh, its Haftorah readings in the Shabbat services. When Isaiah 52, 12 is read, the following week, Isaiah 54 it continues, and this is excerpted out from even synagogue reading because of its clear Christological significance. And I think for that reason and more, we who lament that there are those who claim that the, re that the Holocaust never took place are ourselves guilty of saying that a crucifixion never took place except that of some unhappy, uh, melancholy character who thought himself to be the Messiah and troubled a Roman Empire. And so in misreading the significance of the crucifixion of our own king, we have a necessity ourselves to experience his suffering and by that to say, oh, for our transgressions he was stricken. And so that's a whole message in itself and one I think that history is soon to uh, un unveil. Let's just uh, look at another direction for all of this. Uh, by stressing the centrality of Israel, are you building up again the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile? Uh, quite the contrary. I think that it is the linkage of our mutual identity. Uh, the church somehow has uh, not recognized its, itself and cannot, independent of its relatedness to Israel. And Paul makes it so clear in Ephesians, you who are far off, talking to the Goyim, to the Gentiles, without hope, without God in the world, have been brought nigh by the blood of Israel's Messiah and brought into the covenant and hope of Israel itself, even into the commonwealth of Israel. So until the church recognizes that it has been grafted into the tree of another and sees itself as an independent and autonomous entity, it is disfigured in its own understanding of itself and therefore must malfunction. It is only in the recognition of its union and even its origin out of Israel itself and as an instrument to bring the branches back into its own tree, will the church be the church and will Israel be Israel? And is it at the, at the root of all of this is the church has had a mentality of prosperity and success and has not appropriated for themselves the necessity of the cross in our own lives. And because we haven't taken the cross properly into our own lives, we do not see it for Israel. Isn't that correct? Yeah, well, suffering is intrinsic to the faith and the suffering that precedes the glory. And nothing um, 
makes that principle more apparent than in the role to which God calls the church in regard to Israel in the last days. Our relationship with them has got to be something more than sentimental and more than just a kind of shallow affection because we're cute or we just have a, a, a hope for, for Israel's fulfillment, but the relationship will be costly, especially as the intensification of Israel's calamity unfolds, even to the point of a, a destruction of the political state, a possible expulsion again into the nations. I think that the time of Jacob's trouble indicates an uprooting of Jews worldwide, and that unless there's a church willing to accommodate, receive, provide refuge uh, to Jews in that distressed condition, there'll be no Jewish survival. But it'll not be something that can be provided casually and without cost. It might require even our own, not only inconvenience, but suffering and perhaps even loss of life. And until we're willing for that and actually demonstrate that willingness, how then shall we move Israel to jealousy? We've not yet fulfilled Paul's great statement that um, it's the church that is to move Israel to a jealousy that of such a kind that they will embrace what they have heretofore historically rejected. And I believe that that will come when the church will extend to Israel in compassion that is more than sentimental, but the very heart of God, the willingness to lay down its own life while Israel is yet in the condition of sin and apostasy and judgment, that our affection and our love for Israel is not conditional on Israel's attractiveness, but even when it is stricken and marred more than any man, and there is no beauty that we should desire them, yet do we desire them, because the issue is not what they are in themselves, but what they are in God, beloved. And uh, they, my people have never experienced such, love, such a love. I didn't experience it myself until 37 years ago, when I was myself in a desolate, stricken condition and out in the nations traveling as a hitchhiker and was befriended and taken up by those who picked me up off the side of the road and gave me in some portion that which will be the experience of Jews in the last days, coming to me from Gentiles whom I mistrusted or distrusted and yet showed a kind of uh, love that could not be explained on the basis of my uh, loveliness, but on the basis of the heart of God being expressed through them. It's not going to be anything other than the revelation of the Lord as he in fact is, demonstrated through Gentiles, the Hebraic character of God uh, and the compassionate love of God and identification that will move us to jealousy and therefore to salvation. Yeah, let's follow up with that in terms of your own personal journey. Uh, for the first 20 years of your, of your preaching, uh, you, there was a very strong element of the radical call to discipleship and the kingdom of God insofar as it related to the church. Then from about 1988 on, uh, you took, a, in some sense, a, a, a great turn or a new change came about you in terms of stressing the centrality of Israel. Can you talk about this process in your own life and how that came about? Well, I think it's uh, not coincidental or insignificant that it came during a period of death in my own life. I was sharing only recently uh, with a brother that after 10 years of our community life at a time when we were just about to see daylight after much suffering in the initiating of a community which was new to our experience, that the Lord ended the entire community that he himself initiated and brought everything into a place of death, the abandonment of the property, the loss of our uh, identity as a ministry, the threat even to my own marriage and life and family. And uh, the Lord put me in the seminary during that time, even to heighten the issues of death. It was a liberal Lutheran seminary uh, filled with uh, women who were feminists, if not witches. And so I went through a real season of death that was tasted in abandonment from the property, all without explanation. Even a death to ministry, as the Lord forbade me to speak publicly for a period of 14 months, and in that intense time of tasted and experienced death, of actual expulsion, casting out with the insecurity that came, no for, so form of livelihood, and into the novel environment of a liberal seminary, the Lord began to 
reveal the mystery of Israel. I used to make annual trips to Israel and minister to the church in Israel as I would in any nation to the body of Christ. But until that season of death, I had no understanding of the mystery of Israel per se as a nation and its futures in the theological, uh, the, uh, the theocratic. theocratic intention of God. That came during my time at the seminary. And so I, I raised the question, if it took a season of death to begin to unveil the mystery, what will it take for its fulfillment? And indeed, both here now in front of these cameras and any public proclamation of the mystery, there's always a measure of death yet to be experienced. The Lord is so jealous over this mystery that he required a 14-month period of silence on my part. I could not speak on any subject. Maybe it was clearing the slate for the bringing forth of a subject now on time for the church to be prophetically proclaimed that needed somehow <clears throat> a season in which there'd be no speaking at all. And so from that point on, about 1988, the Lord began the unveiling of this mystery, and even the explanation that was given me when I first set foot on the uh, property in Minnesota, End Time Teaching Center Community Refuge. Refuge for what? Now I understood. Refuge for Jews in North America from a flight from persecution that will be worldwide global. In your opinion, what exactly is the modern state of Israel, and what is going on there at this present time? Well, it's a... Uh, people in a nation called to collapse. And um, very few understand that, but I think if we would look at the text in Ezekiel chapter 22, the Lord makes clear that there's a last day's return, not for fulfillment or success, but for judgment. And um, it's called a furnace in chapter 22 of Ezekiel. Son of man, verse 18, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead. In the <clears throat> midst of the furnace, they are even the dross of silver. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have all become dross, behold, therefore, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. That somehow the dealing of God must take place in the land. And so that it's not an exaggeration to say that the, re the establishment of the state in 1948 is not for its permanency or fulfillment as a prophetic destiny, but for the initial judgment that sets in motion those things that will culminate in that final restoration. There's a judgment that precedes a restoration. There's a severity of God that precedes a goodness. And somehow in the wisdom of God, Jerusalem itself has got to be the vortex. Of course, when God says Jerusalem, he means as well all Israel. And what do we see, practically speaking, but since 1948 and now increasingly in this more recent time, issues of such a kind that, as I've said before, compel a line of conduct that is thoroughly un-Jewish. And um, we needed to see that. We needed to experience that that we who had complained of Nazi mistreatment are now ourselves being called Nazi. We who were the victims of racist mentalities are now being accused ourselves of a racist mentality, and not without some substance in these accusations, all to bring us to the place of the acknowledgement of God's truth, that there's in man no good thing. And when God will mock iniquity, who can stand? This must be experienced by Israel, or we cannot fulfill our destiny. How shall we be a nation of priests to the world and bring a knowledge of God's so great salvation without first understanding the desperate necessity from that, for that salvation that in man is no good thing and that God alone is our righteousness except that our awareness of our own condition has been marked by our own conduct. There's no cheap way out. If we will refuse the word of God and the indictment that comes to the word, whether we are Israel, the church, or individuals, we must then therefore experience the reality of that in our experience. It's a last resort from God. It's a painful uh, reality, but one that cannot be omitted. And I've, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the purpose of the establishment of the state in 1948 is not for its success, but for its necessary failure. And that the scriptures, both here in Ezekiel and elsewhere, indicate a necessity for Israel to be tried as 
a metal and uh, a um, crucible of f heat in order to smelt and remove the impurity and that we might come out before God and before men and before nations as the righteousness of God, revealing not our virtue, but his. So this goes back to the principle that in all of our discussion, we're not trying to elevate Israel, we're not trying to elevate the church, but only the glory of God, that all things must be done unto his glory. Isn't that correct? If we miss that principle, we miss everything. And of course, that was at the heart of the Apostle Paul, as he concludes his great dissertation on the mystery of Israel, Romans 9 through 11, for of him and through him and to him, in verse 36 of chapter 11, um, be glory forever. So the issue for Paul, great apostle that he was, and great um, Jew identifying with his own people in the first verses of chapter 9, I would wish myself a curse for my brethren's sake, in the end shows us his apostolic heart, that however great his endearment for his own people and that of the church for which he labored day and night, there is an issue that exceeds both. And if we miss that, we miss both our significance to Israel and to the church, and that is the glory of God forever. And my own experience as a minister to the church is that that is wanting in the church's own deepest consciousness. We have become too utilitarian, too pragmatic, too oriented to success and to programs, and have missed a jealousy for God's glory, which is the central and indefatigable heart of the apostle and therefore for a church called to be apostolic and prophetic. And so my prayer often is, Lord, restore to the church a jealousy for your glory, for only that will permit the kind of sacrifice that the church will be required to make in order to fulfill the mystery of God. If it's just Israel's sake or just the church's sake, is not incentive enough in itself, but the glory of God that abides forever is. This is not a little icing on the cake. This is not a little rhetorical flourish that Paul employs. It's the statement of his deepest apostolic heart. And the church, until it comes to that, can never claim to be apostolic, though it claims it. And uh, so, yes, it's this jealousy and this understanding that the issue is not Israel in itself, nor even the, either the church. Both are instrumentalities for a much greater revelation, the glory of God forever. Yes. And that will require, as glory always does, suffering. Simeon, who was uh, waiting for the consolation of Israel, he took the baby Jesus in his arms and called him a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. What did he see at that time that the church has lost sight of or has never seen concerning the mystery of the centrality of Israel? Well, that's a remarkable uh, text that initiates the, um, the drama of uh, Jesus as Israel's Messiah, that he could recognize a babe being brought into the temple for the necessary uh, dedication, circumcision, and uh, being brought by the Spirit and seeing by the Spirit that in this innocuous child is the fulfillment of all Israel's destiny. So unless that mystery is revealed by the Spirit, there's no understanding. What distinguished this dear man is that he's called a just and righteous man waiting for the consolation of Israel, which is more than the success of the state. And unless we are waiting and expecting and looking for the greater consolation that has as its consequence the glory of God, we will not see. Uh, in the state now, in its pitiful condition, uh, the ultimate fulfillment of this so great destiny. The parallel with the infant Jesus and the infant state is remarkable. The corollary of the two are inseparable. And so um, what is required is a certain disposition of heart that waits. And waits for what? For the consolation of Israel. He would not be consoled by anything less nor other than God's own divine and supernatural fulfillment that has its origin in this infant. And so we must also look upon present Israel, however unhappy its condition and increasing distress, as also the nucleus and the essential commencement of what will consummate later in a glory. Our problem is that we're not righteous, and therefore we're not seeing. And though we celebrate the Holy Spirit in our language,
We are not led into the temple of God by the Spirit, nor do we see by the Spirit. We have our own agenda. We want to see Israel to succeed. Why? Because we want to succeed. We only project upon the nation what we desire for ourselves religiously, and so therefore we're disqualified from seeing that which is ultimate, and therefore until we can see it, how shall we perform it? The church, I'm very fond of saying, is called to ultimacy. It's called to a prophetic and apostolic fulfillment which cannot be performed out of, our, out of our own human or religious well-meaning intention or ability, but only out of the ground of the life of God in resurrection and ascension power. And uh, therefore, we're acting and living out beneath the level of God's intention because we've not seen the ultimate issue of Israel and the church, which is the purpose for which we are <laughs> speaking these things uh, into these cameras today. Yes, and another one of the main problems of the church, I believe, is the painful ignorance of the prophetic scriptures. There are most of the pro prophetic scriptures are yet to be fulfilled, and the, to me there is a painful ignorance of all that is prophesied, all that is mm -hmm. spoken about, yeah. all that is promised in the restoration of Israel and the consummation of all things. And yet, uh, ironically, by a church that somehow celebrates prophecy, in fact, this is the season, and I, after my 30, in all my 37 years as a believer, I've not seen uh, prophecy and the prophetic call more celebrated than presently by men whose qualification, in my own estimate, is dubious. And in fact, I don't think that the church can even distinguish between the gift of prophecy and the office of prophet. And yet we run after men to hear a word that somehow will inform us that God knows of us and has some personal and relevant thing to communicate, which of course is of clear value, but there's something much greater in the issue of prophecy. Jesus himself identifies himself with that call, that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. My God, if that's so, let's not traffic in something so holy and cheapen it by some kind of dubious uh, counterfeit, but let's wait for and look for and have an appreciation for that which is ultimate. And uh, so I'm, I'm suspicious of those who are running after so-called prophets who neglect or ignore the canon of prophetic scripture itself. And even there, we can misread it or mechanically seek to understand it or think that we're seeing its fulfillment unless our own understanding is opened for its interpretation. And I believe that a key to that comes from prophetic men themselves who have authentically been called to that office. And though I will probably heap upon my own head some scorn as celebrating myself, I believe that that is my call. And because it is, I'm privileged to have a certain understanding and appreciation of scripture that is not given to others, not for my enjoyment, but for my communication. An example would be Ezekiel 37 in the Valley of Dry Bones, which like many I had believed previously is already in process of fulfillment, and that the dry bones coming together is already the state of Israel, and now God is adding the flesh and then subsequently the spirit. But a better and deeper reading of the text indicates that the death is yet future, and yet we're in process toward it now. And that what God is waiting for and has not yet obtained is the acknowledgement of the nation itself that we are without hope, and that we are as dry bones. And that realization is yet future, and the events that are taking place are calculated to bring the nation to that acknowledgement. God waits for it. And interestingly, when it comes, he himself does not address the bones, but he turns to another called the Son of Man, prophesy to those bones that they might live. And so when the Lord opened my own understanding in conjunction with the event of the Intifada and the first stones that were thrown, I began then to reappraise this text and to see it in a way in which I now proclaim it, not as something uh, past, but something future, and therefore it's a death that needs to be foreseen <clears throat> that we need to brace ourselves to understand, and, but more than that, to be the son of man who will be called to prophesy. For unless that word of a resurrection, authority, and power issues from a son of man company, namely the church, brought to an ultimate constituency 
and maturity in God, those bones will remain bones. And there we have the whole mystery. We have the Israel in its depleted condition, unable to aid itself, and something must come to it <clears throat> from outside itself, or it cannot live. And that something is not the direct action of God, but something coming from, symbolically, a figure called the Son of Man, a prophetic figure called to prophesy, but to prophesy in a faith that transcends its even own prophetic ability and a love by which faith works that exceeds its own mere affection, which is to say that it has to receive and come into both the faith of the Son of God and the love of God, or those bones remain fixed in death. So the issue of Israel in the last analysis is not Israel. Israel must necessarily be brought to a place that is inert and incapable of its own restoration. Why? Because we're Jews. Because we see, look, man, no hands. Because historically we have come back time after time from misfortune and reestablished ourselves. Expelled out of Spain, we come into the New World. After the Holocaust, we come here, we succeed here. We even establish a state. And in 50 years, we resuscitate a dead liturgical language and become a hi-fi, high-tech civilization and one of the great military powers of the earth in half a century. Who's heard of such accomplishment? And yet we cannot succeed on that basis. We have got to be brought to such a place of death in which there's no hope and that we ourselves acknowledge that we are without hope. God waits for verse 11 of Ezekiel chapter 37. We are cut off. We are as dry bones. We are without hope. When God hears that acknowledgement coming from Jews, the epitome of mankind, of uh, human presumption and self-sufficiency, then he's released to look to a son of man prophesied to those bones. But the issue is, when Israel comes to that death, will there be a church that has come to that prophetic maturity that can be commanded to prophesy and can prophesy in a faith that exceeds its own faith and that works only by love, that is more than mere sentimental affinity with Israel? So the issue in the last analysis is not Israel. The issue is the church, but a church that has come of age. Art, it's clear that anti-Semitism, with its long history, is still on the rise. How should we understand this, and why is God allowing this at this time? It is so painful a question that I'm almost brought to tears to consider it. I know the sense of anguish that is increasing uh, through Jews and Jews throughout the world. Because uh, who could have expected that within a half century of the Holocaust itself, this phenomenon should again be asserting itself? We would have thought that the, that the world would have been chastised by the horror of the Holocaust, but before it has uh, uh, elapsed, we're seeing again conditions of a kind that have always signaled terrible catastrophe for the Jewish community and are again bringing that sense of dread. The remarkable thing is that it's arising from sectors in the world where we would have least have expected it. And from sectors within those nations, among the educated, trade unions, uh, green movements, peace movements, formerly having an affinity with Israel, now standing profoundly against it and calling us Goliath, calling us racist, calling us Nazi, refusing to unload uh, uh, Israeli cargoes coming to nations, uh, cutting off contracts, and taking forms in France and uh, nations where we've had a comfortable existence. And what form of anti-Semitism? But going back to the Middle Ages of the blood libel that we kill uh, Gentile children in order to take their blood in the making of our ceremonial and uh, ritual needs of matzah. Who has ever heard that such things would be dug out again uh, from the history of the Dark Ages and be employed in modern times taught us, and they're irrefutable. How do, you, how do you answer such categorical charges? So I know that there's a sense of dread coming into the Jewish community. My God, again? Isn't there any surcease from these things? Don't we ever come to a place of security where we can at least rest our heads in an enlightened 20th century and say that these things shall not haunt us again. And so we're preparing a whole booklet for Jewish consideration on these very questions. And in it, we're, we're wanting to explain uh, 
that this phenomenon has haunted us throughout our history and that it even predates the advent of Christianity itself. It cannot be explained as something that merely issues from Christendom or the misuse of New Testament scripture. We were haunted before even the advent of those things. That somehow it seems always to be dogging our steps. And I want to suggest that it itself is a judgment coming out of a covenantal failure and that we will never be relieved of the ogre and the fear of anti-Semitism and the horrors that issue from it until we will have been brought back into a relationship with God. We must deal with the root cause. God is chastising us and bringing us into a consciousness that something is amiss and that is not to be corrected by secular authorities. We're not to appeal to France to protect us in our synagogues and our Jewish youth and our streets when the phenomenon is our own problem, namely our covenantal failure that invites this kind of expression coming out of nations. May we be spurred by these increasing reports that will haunt us in every place, will not be safe in any place, that is an expression of something to do with our failure before God and our covenantal obligation that releases these evils to provoke us to a return and that no human authority can save us from the threat and the terror that must necessarily come. Only our return to the God whom we have historically neglected, if not rejected, and therefore suffer the consequence that must follow. Yes, in this hour that we've been speaking, we've stated very clearly that Israel is a central nation to all nations, and that it has an irrevocable destiny that it's always a witness nation, whether in apostasy or in faithfulness. And really the question is, how far will God go to establish the fulfillment of Israel's theocratic destiny and the establishment of his kingdom? What is the, this destiny of Israel that we're And as we have failed in the nations and to the nations, as a nation of priests and a light unto the world, it is in the nations and out of the nations that our distress and haunting this, uh, calamities I issue. They'll never be resolved until we will be to the nations what God intended, a nation of priests and a light unto the world. If we ourselves are not in that light, how shall we be it to others? And for the want of that light, anti-Semitism is itself a deviant conduct that issues out of darkness. So we have brought a judgment out of our own failure that will not be rectified until we ourselves shall be that which God intended. And yet, ironically, our cry is, we want to be as other nations. Why, why, do, why must some conduct be expected of us that is not expected of others? We, will, we still stubbornly reject our own destiny and our own call, and we are paying the cost of that rejection. So you're saying that there's a time of great trouble ahead for Israel. It must come. It must come.
now come to the time when we're going to discuss the fulfillment of the mystery of Israel and the church. In other words, the function and the purpose that each provides for the other. And Art, in order to do this, I think we have to bring in the topic of the principalities and powers of the air. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I'd like to read a very weighty quote of yours that you've written in your book uh, called The Mystery of Israel and the Church. As we have said, the church that can move Israel to jealousy is the church that can defeat the powers of the air. Whatever is required for the one serves also for the other. We know that there are two mysteries to be fulfilled. One is the mystery of Israel, and the other is the eternal purpose of God through the church of manifesting the manifold wisdom of God to the, to the principalities and powers of the air. There are two mysteries that are waiting to be fulfilled for which purpose God has created all things. Well, that's a remarkable statement, but true. And my experience confirms that the church that is ignorant of the mystery of Israel is equally ignorant of the mystery spoken in Ephesians chapter 3 of the eternal purpose of God for the church, and that somehow both mysteries are reconciled in one at the end of the age. The fulfillment of the one is the fulfillment of the other. But what do we mean by that? Maybe we should look uh, briefly at the text in Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul speaks of um, his privileged call to make all men see in verse 9 what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers uh, in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. That is so remarkable a statement that uh, unless the Lord give us, gives us a, a, an especial grace, we will pass it over. It will be a gloss. We will look upon it as some kind of Paul uh, getting um, away with things and speaking at a high, lofty level that sounds good, but we're not to take it terribly seriously. But I think that we need really to focus in on this very heart of the church and its mystery, call to a fulfillment of an ultimate kind that seems so foolish that it has to do with a demonstration that only the church itself can make of the manifold wisdom of God. What is that? And to whom is that demonstration made? Not to the world, but to some ethereal, lofty presence in the heavenlies of something called the principalities and powers of the air. And most of us flinch from even that kind of recognition because it's out of keeping with our enlightenment view of reality not having to do with invisible spirit entity. And yet, the irony is that the invisible realm is the ultimate realm and the very uh, Ursprung, the German word, the origin and foundation of all reality. And only the church is called both to recognize and to deal with that realm of spirit reality called the principalities and powers of the air. But deal with it how? By a defeat that only it can bring as the church in manifesting the wisdom of God. What is that wisdom? Well, it has to do with what Jesus himself demonstrated at the cross when he made of those same powers a, um, a mock and a defeated, disarmed uh, enemy and made of them a public spoil, a display. By what? By a wisdom demonstrated in himself at the greatest suffering that the powers themselves had inflicted in bringing him to the cross. Because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that if the rulers of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul there is not speaking about earthly rulers, but the ultimate rulers that move the wellsprings of nations in the world, that realm of powers that abide in the air and above nations to influence if not control them. You say, Art, oh, that's a, a speculative concept. Oh, really? How can you understand the phenomenon of Nazism and, uh, and remove that consideration? In modern times, the taking over of the whole apparatus of state by the powers of the air unto the annihilation of, of European Jewry is the very demonstration of their truth. And Paul is saying that they crucified the Lord of glory. Had they known, they would not have done so. If they had known, what would be the result of the outworking of their spiteful vehemence against the Son of God? 
they would not have crucified. Yes, they used the instrumentality of Roman law and Jewish uh, indignation against Christ, and they expressed it in the wisdom peculiar to themselves. Violence, power, death, threat, intimidation, and fear. And that's exactly the same complex of things that will come against the church in the last days by those same powers. And when we will demonstrate in our response to them what Jesus did at the cross, the age will have been ended. That is to say, the wisdom of God is the character of God. And nowhere more revealed than when it is the object of the contrary wisdom, which is the powers of the air in their vengeful display of murderous intention against God and against his people. And so I am feeling frustrated. This needs explication of an extensive kind, and yet I'm hoping that a little opportunity here will begin at least to initiate an inquiry into the heart of what we often pass over, and yet it is the call of the church that except that the church make it manifest, it will not be made manifest at all. So, and it has to do, it says in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which you purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church has got to embrace what is God's purpose. And the remarkable thing is, it has not a thing to do with any benefit that accrues to itself by its willingness to take upon itself such a fulfillment because it's only God's satisfaction. It is his eternal purpose. It has not even anything to do with that which comes to the church or to the world, but with the principalities and powers of the air. So a church that is willing to take God's eternal purpose into its consideration, not just as a consideration, but its foremost consideration, though it has nothing to do with its own self-aggrandizement or benefit, is exactly the church. And what rules the world is self-interest. So the church, in putting the purpose of God before its own, demonstrates in that one act that the powers of the principalities that play upon the world do not play upon it. We are not ruled by self-interest, by programs, by success, but we are ruled by the eternal purpose of God, not only when it does not bring us any benefit, but opens us to an opposition of a kind that would require perhaps even our life and would not have been our fate if we had not sought to fulfill the eternal purpose of God. The wisdom of God is self-sacrifice. The wisdom of God is the character of God. It's the humility of God. It's the selflessness of God demonstrated at the cross for others. And the whole world is moving in the wisdom of the powers to seek for itself its own satisfaction, its own delight, its own benefit, its own benevolence. To break that power is something that only the church can demonstrate because it has a purpose beyond itself given by God to fulfill an eternal purpose that God waits only for the church to demonstrate. But it cannot be fulfilled by individual virtuosos. The church means the entire conglomerate, the entire corporate entity that has as its first purpose for being not its own satisfaction, but God's. When the powers see a church like that, they tremble. For Jesus they know and Paul they know, but the church at Portland, Oregon, or Timbuktu, or Chicago that is still rooted in its own selfishness, its own programs, its own satisfaction, its own success, does not threaten them at all. So how does this tie in with the mystery of Israel? The church that is jealous for the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose without any benefit to itself will be jealous for God's eternal purpose for Israel without benefit to itself. It will be to Israel that self-sacrificing entity and demonstrate in its willingness to suffer for another what is the unique wisdom of God demonstrated at the cross. In a word, it's a formula for suffering, for death, for martyrdom. The church that is a martyr church is the church that exemplifies and demonstrates this wisdom. And when the powers of the air see it, they are defeated. For how shall they tempt such a church? How shall they manipulate such a church that is not ruled by its own self-interest, 
and is willing in the fulfillment of God's purposes not only to suffer and to sacrifice, but even to run the prospect of death. In the absence of that, we have churches today that are institutions that seek their own fulfillment. They are self-perpetuating bodies that seek only their own self-aggrandizement, their own success. And they may well succeed in those programs, and in succeeding even confer a modicum and a measure of blessing to those who participate. But they will not fulfill God's eternal purpose for the church. And the church that will not consider and make as its first purpose, his eternal purpose, is disqualified in any way from being the prophetic and apostolic entity to which we are called. We are not called to be an institution that mediates blessings for men. We are called to be an entity that fulfills the eternal purposes of God. And only a church that can and will can be to Israel what it must. Only a church like that will move it to jealousy. For so long as the Jews see nothing more than their own Jewish institutions replicated by Gentiles, to what jealousy will it move them? But a people who are willing to be a sacrifice. Isn't it interesting that the very first verse after Paul's remarkable statement in Romans 9 through 11 on the mystery of Israel is to make of our bodies a living sacrifice. So the two mysteries have got to be fulfilled and when we will be to the Jew what we must in the last days, at the likely risk of our own life, like those uh, precious saints of World War II who hid Jews and were found out like Corrie ten Boom and were brought into concentration camps and into uh, terror and death, will this mystery be fulfilled? So may God give the church that vision, that desire. It's interesting that in the first speaking on the subject of the mystery of Israel, after a 14-month sabbatical silence where the Lord forbade me to speak on any subject and began to open to me this mystery and was broken by an invitation coming from a pastor whom I did not know, Art, we believe that God wants you to speak to us a seminar on Israel the church in the last days. The exact phrase to which I had come as the Lord had begun to unveil this mystery. And I came to that congregation in California in fasting and in prayer for 10 days, not having spoken for 14 months, which is itself as a death, and opened up from the very first message the mystery of the church that will move Jews to jealousy and to say to those hearing me, where has the church historically fulfilled this as a church? Individual cases, yes, but as the church at large, the Jews are yet waiting for such a fulfillment. And I did not answer what kind of a church it would be. And I went on from message to message, went to bed after the sixth message on Saturday, Sunday morning being the seventh and concluding message, not knowing what it would be. And three o'clock on Sunday morning, a.m., the Lord wakened me with a start with one word, martyrdom. My final message was that the church that will move Israel to jealousy is a martyr church. Whatever martyrdom means, as was exemplified by the first martyr Stephen, so also it will be exemplified by the church of the last days and a martyrdom for a people now hated all the world over the Jew and yet embraced by Gentiles, the church, in a loving way at the risk and cost of its own life. Who can explain this? This is beyond institution. This is beyond religion. This is beyond sentiment. This is a church that has come into such a union with God himself as to express his character which is the wisdom of God, the self-sacrificing nature of God for another. And so in the fulfillment of our role toward the Jew, we fulfill the mystery spoken here in Ephesians, but it needs to come into our consciousness because it will affect and change everything. It will make our programs to look shoddy, trivial, inadequate, and give us the kind of focus and parameters of faith for which we were intended and need to hear again. This apostolic call brought to us by foundational men, apostles and prophets, who alone can make the, this ring with conviction in our own hearts so as to embrace the sacrifice that it will require. What, what we're seeing instead is a kind of propheticness and apostolicity of a cheap kind that requires nothing and is very appealing to people who are situated 
in their comfort and in their security and can dabble in a vocabulary that seems to give a certain note of excitement but not require the sacrifice unto martyrdom that is the genius of the church and the very wisdom of God explicated at the cross and now waiting for a final statement as it comes from the body of Christ itself as it will be called to perform for Jews despised everywhere in the world but by themselves. When Jews see this coming from Gentiles, they'll be moved to jealousy. There'll be no way to explain it. It will be the very revelation of the character and nature of God himself unto their salvation. So may the church brood over this call and be willing to adopt it at whatever cost to itself. For that very willingness is the wisdom of God. The church that forsakes its own self-interest, its own program, and opens itself to the retaliation of the powers of the dark of the air who now recognize in it Jesus we know and Paul we know, and now we have to acknowledge we know you now also. Now you're a threat. Now we're going to retaliate. Now is going to come upon you things that you would not have had to experience had you remained in your intrinsic Christian selfishness. But now that you have consciously vowed to make this the first purpose for your being, you're a mocked enemy, and upon you will be the expression of our vindictiveness. And you'll only be, and how does that serve the purpose of God? Because the church can only bear it corporately, only bear it in prayer, and count it privilege. So may the church come of age. And, and fulfill these great mysteries that wait the, cons uh, the consummation of the age. The issue of Israel is the issue of the church, but the church of what kind? Not one that plays with the vocabulary of that which is apost apostolic and prophetic and has its own little darling men who have given themselves such titles, but those who can bring to us the timeless and eternal purpose of God in such a way as to gain our willingness to fulfill it at whatever cost. We can't fulfill this except through suffering. And the very willingness to bear suffering for another, namely the satisfaction of God and not our own because it fulfills his eternal purpose, is itself that demonstration. Contrary to all the ethos, of the world that says, take care of number one, see to yourself first, your own enjoyment, your own satisfaction, even as Christians. And so long as we remain in that mentality, the powers of the air can yawn in our face all the more when we profess to take cities for Christ. By what? By worship, by technology, by, by amplifiers, or by the demonstration of a wisdom which can only be ours at the cross of sacrifice and suffering because it pertains to his satisfaction and his glory. May the Lord raise up such a church in these last days is our cry and the reason for which we are establishing these very videos today. Art, I'd like to follow up with a further look at uh, the situation between the first martyr, Stephen, and Saul, who of course later became Paul. We note that uh, that Saul did not become a believer at that time mm -hmm. as he witnessed this. And I'd like to uh, read a quote of yours and have you respond to it. As Stephen's radiant face and martyr death was a seed that later brought about Saul's conversion, so the church's radiant face brought on by a genuine union with Christ will be a pre-witness for Israel. And the capstone comes when they shall see the Lord himself whom they have pierced. Something sets them up in watching the death of a people willing to be martyred for their sake, though they may not immediately respond. Something is sown in their thought, consciousness, and hearts that prods them and goads them, which the Lord later calls for in a future revelation by which the whole thing comes together and they understand. What a marvelous observation. I'd like you to expound on that, please. Now, this is a remarkable paradigm. I, I agree with Watchman Nee that often what is given in the scriptures at first has a final and ultimate consummation at the end. And surely the conversion of Saul to Paul, the commencement of the career ministry of the great apostle, uh, commencing with the demonstration of Stephen's martyrdom is not something that we can ignore because Paul kicked against the pricks. Why? He saw something demonstrated by a busboy, uh, the least of men, that he knew that no amount of religion could ever obtain. It, was, it exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees because 
Stephen died not reluctantly or begrudging his fate or with some expression of self-pity. That would cancel out the meaning of martyrdom, but a joyous privilege of giving himself uh, in the form of Christ's own sacrifice and being called to it without reluctance, without misgiving, with complete confidence in the sovereignty of God that I'm fulfilling the purpose for which I have been called and I'm filling it, fulfilling it in such a way as God need not explain to me and I can bear even the stones of that painful demise with rejoicing and even with compassion for those who are inflicting it because I'm seeing the heavens opened and Jesus at the right hand of the Father. His face shone like an angel. He was filled with the Spirit. What a picture of God's intention for the church of the last days. That martyrdom is not some unwilling and reluctant thing that we have to take in some self-pitying way, but it, with a joyous embrace. Whether or not our life is required, the issue of martyrdom is not what f f befalls us in a final moment, but characterizes all our moments. It's a mode of being for those who s continually see a heaven opened and Jesus at the right hand of the Father, which means that his sovereignty is being fulfilled whether it requires our life or not. For that, it that was an ultimate demonstration for Saul. And finally, he could not shake it. And when the Lord confronted him, he confronted him on the basis of what he had seen in, in Stephen's willing sacrifice. And so I think, again, in the last days, a soul nation called to an apostolate like Paul. We have an apostolate as Jews to all the nations. That's the reason why Paul was made an apostle to the nations, to the Goyim, to the Gentiles. And he said, when you, what you see in me is a man out of time and out of joint. But what you see is a preview of my nation's own calling to the nations. And we can only fulfill it in the grandeur that comes with an embrace of that apostolate that requires the deepest conversion and final confrontation uh, that in opposition to that which we think most threatens our Judaism, uh, which is what was represented by these heretics like Stephen, dying for his so-called apostate Judaism, but dying in such a way as to reveal what only suffering and death can reveal. For suffering and death reveal ultimately. And that's why the uh, centurion at the cross, seeing the suffering and death of Jesus, born with the same kind of magnanimity and grace and trust and joy as Stephen had to say, truly, this was the Son of God. And when we who cannot even stand any rejection or someone speaking adversely or things imagined or real can bear an ultimate sacrifice with the same joy, Jewry will see the ultimate revelation that only willing suffering and sacrifice can reveal because that is the nature of God. That is God. What Jesus revealed at the cross and what Stephen revealed at his stoning was nothing less nor other than what God is in himself, a self-sacrificing God who ultimately, at pain, gives of himself for others even unto death. That's God's very nature. And we Jews have not seen it from that which is called the church. The church has been for us an object of foreboding and mistrust rather than some self-yielding, self-sacrificial entity willing to bear even our insult, even if we should be the instrument of their martyrdom, which we may well have to be, and bear it with grace, they will then be so pricked as to lay the foundation for their own ultimate and deep conversion by which we can be to the nations what Paul was to the church. We will come into our apostolate as he came into his by an example set before us by a willing sacrifice, a Stephen church of the last days. So the paradigm is powerful if we will but see it and be willing for it. And when we go deeper into the anatomy of martyrdom and that of Stephen, what was he but a waiter on tables and had to feed the widows and listen to their relentless a complaint and accusation that this one is getting more than that one. He was shaped in the character of God by the daily buffeting and suffering that came from the embrace of ordinary things to which he was called. And we will come to it equally in the same way.
we need to come to the school of martyrdom, the character of martyr, martyrdom, in the daily things that are before us, in the obedience in the school of the Spirit as God will give it to us, so that in the ultimate moment, we can be what all our moments before us were, self-sacrificing and yielding. Uh, because, as I'm saying, martyrdom is not the issue of a final moment, but all our moments. Where is the church today called to that kind of consciousness and to that kind of role? It needs to be, and in fact, that is what church in fact is, is the congregation of martyrs who bear one another in the suffering that we invariably even bring to one another, in misunderstanding and immaturity and, and the various kinds of things that we bear, that, that we might come to the character of God and the moment ultimately when it will be required of us. So may the, God, may the Lord raise up a Stephen people for the last days whose demonstration to Israel will be the very factor of their radical conversion, the embrace of their apostolate, and to be to the nations the kind of blessing that Paul was to the Gentile church, that when he said to the believers at Ephesus, the leaders of the church, you'll see my face no more. And you know what manner of man I was to you from the beginning. I never took anything from you, but day and night, uh, with tears, both in public places and from house to house, I proclaimed all the counsel of God. When they heard that he, they would see his face no more, they wept. Where, where in history have Gentiles ever wept when a Jew has announced his coming demise? But he was to them a mother, a father, a brooded over them, that Christ be formed them. He was a self-sacrificing, giving, yielding Jew for the church, for the Gentiles, that God calls Israel to be to the nations. Yes, to Jordan, to... Uh, uh, Iraq to uh, Sudan to uh, Palestinians to all those who are presently harassing us and for whom we should have every reason for resentment and rejection God calls us to be the loving ministers of the gospel of his grace and mercy and the brokenness that will come to us in the last days and the example provided by the church itself so it's a very great mystery and it'll take a very great grace to fulfill it and that grace will be given us when the Lord sees our willing hearts. What I'm hearing you say is that we need a church that transcends the sentimental view that the church has, and many Christians have, of many issues in life, themselves, God, Israel. In other words, it's a sentimental view and not a view based on the timeless wisdom of God. Now, how can the church get to the place where it is truly apostolic, where it truly views things with a view towards the end, which was truly uh, something that uh, highlighted and demarcated the apostolic view. The issue is the cross and even the willingness to bring to death or to die to our sentimental view. A sentimental view is always softer than God's own seeing and always makes a lesser requirement. Sentiment is the great enemy and opposition to the love of God. And uh, I don't know that he can shed abroad that love in our hearts so long as sentiment itself fills it. We have, be, we have to be willing to forsake the lesser for the greater, but sentiment is a self-serving uh, uh, device. And so it stands as an impediment to the agreement with God in his own prophetic seeing. It's no accident that before the Son of Man could prophesy to the dry bones in Ezekiel, he first had to be, br be brought out by the hand of the Lord and, and by the Spirit and brought down and into the valley of dry bones. He had to be brought out from his charismatic advantage and his superficial seeing that was an enjoyment to himself and to be brought down and into a valley of the reality and truth of things as God himself sees them and as the flesh itself wants to shrink from seeing. We would much rather sentimentalize than see the truth of something, not only of Israel, but ourselves, the church, the nation, our children. We're, we're continually faced with the issue of true seeing. And, uh, and so the, uh, the character of the church has got to take on some apostolic proportions that means the operation of the cross that separate us from the sentimental and humanly tinctured viewing to that which is of God's. There's a whole mindset that, to which we're called, that, and Israel is the key to the opening of this whole thing, because Israel is the issue of God's cosmic drama.
the issue of an ultimate fulfillment, the, an ultimate redemption of a nation out of suffering and death and into a final millennial stature that blesses all the families of the earth. And so the church has got to know that we're moving toward a consummation. It sees an end it, that changes its view of one Sunday merely succeeding another. There's a dimension of, of expectancy, of apocalyptic uh, judgments that must come, of uh, what's the word for the expectation of the end? Eschatol an eschatological seeing that is intrinsic to apostolic calling. And the church that begins to embrace these things will signal to the powers of the air that it is an entity that needs to be opposed. And the church is willing to bear that opposition because it has caught glimpse of the ultimate glory of God that comes through this consummation. But in doing that, it breaks its harmony with the world. It brings itself into a place of disjuncture with the world. It takes upon itself the view that the uh, apostles and prophets have always had of the world as intrinsically evil and opposed to God. It sees through the subtlety of the world and in its best forms as being intrinsically opposed to God and needing to be hated and uh, for, for which one needs to be separated. And that brings upon it a further opposition, but it, it gives the church a view of true value and it begins to walk in a way that it has shocked off the allurements of the world and is a living example of those who are moving by another wisdom. And its very example frees those that are captive to ambition, to fame, to success. It's a church that, the, that because it has such a view of the things that are ultimate and final and is moving consciously toward that at the cost of willing sacrifice, is emancipated from the kinds of bondages that fall upon men in the world. Its very existence is a testimony and a statement of what it means to be free in Christ and what it means to live by another wisdom. And the evidence that they have succeeded in this is that its own children are persuaded. Instead of the reluctant teenagers that fill the balcony or for whom we have to find some cunning program, the children themselves witness the authenticity of what it is that their parents are about and willingly join themselves with it in a last day's sense of impending consequence that justifies all. This is apostolic and unless the church is demonstrating this to Israel, how shall Israel itself take upon itself its apostolate? So there are certain aspects of understanding, a mindset, a, a mode of being that is at the heart of that which is apostolic that the church needs to find and uh, demonstrate. And that this is uh, the authenticity that the powers of the air despise and fear. And uh, it shatters all that is sentimental and shallow, external, superficial, and calls for real submission to an authority uh, to a breaking of the power of our self-interest, our willingness to submit what we think is the will of God to the authority in the church. It, it brings a, a reality and a tightening of all dimensions of the faith that heretofore were shallow and only just verbal and phraseological rather than actual. And the key to that whole configuration of mindset and practice is the understanding of God's ultimate intention for Israel that can only be obtained by a church of this kind. And so a church of this kind has its power and authority reflected in its own prayers, in its own intercessions, its own witness, its own life together is already a reality of a kingdom come and that which is future. But it needs to be seen, it needs to be embraced, it needs to be sought. And it's clear that we cannot move from where we presently are to that kind of reality, that kind of demonstration, except at the cost of sacrifice, which is the issue of the cross itself. In a word, the mystery of Israel requires the cross to be restored to the church in all of its meaning and actuality as being something more than a decoration, a motif, an architectural image.
And uh, that is the wisdom of God, the reality of God, the power of God, and the glory of God. And that Jews wait to see, as Paul needed to see it in the demonstration of a self-sacrificing martyr, Israel needs to see it in the demonstration of a self-sacrificing church. Art, I know that you believe uh, passionately that the uh, things that occurred in the apostolic church are very crucially instructive for us today. Absolutely. Let's look at uh, the episode with Ananias and Sapphira, two individuals who mm -hmm. had the judgment of God fall on them because they, they offered the part in place of the whole. I think that's a particularly significant uh, episode and uh, one that is uh, very appropriate for the church in its present condition. Today we would be impressed with the kind of offering that they made and we would ask no questions. We're only too glad to receive the sum, but an apostle discerned the deception. And it's not only a deception against men, it's a deception against God. Why have you lied against the Holy Spirit? And the lie is to give an appearance of something being the whole of the sacrifice when it is in fact only the part. And I think that that cuts to the heart of our present Christianity. We speak the vocabulary, we make the motions, but there's an element of deception by which we ourselves uh, are deceived because of an unwillingness to bring the whole and to make a measure of, the, of our giving to stand for it. And God was so jealous over the character of the church that he did not think it too extravagant to slay both husband and wife who thought to pull off this deception. But they could not escape the, the uh, tremendous discernment of the apostle himself, equally jealous for the truth and the reality of the church. And so um, it's a, we need to be sobered by this. And I've often asked the church, are you willing for a return of this kind of divine jealousy that will carry out feet first, those who are playing at the game uh, and making the appearance of something that is only in part and not at whole? I think that the, the candidates to be carried out would be numerous, but it says that great fear fell upon them all. <clears throat> and I think that there was more instruction for the young men who carried out both husband and wife and buried them than could have been gained in, in years in schools of discipleship and in seminaries. So until we come to a reality where our lives match our profession, we're not going to be either the answer of the fulfillment of the eternal mystery of the pur uh, purposes of God that will th uh, challenge the powers of the air and finally defeat them, nor be to Israel what we must. There needs to be a uh, utterness toward God, a totality in which we ourselves will not condescend to a practice either in word or deed that appears to be other than what it is. We will recognize in fact that we have been shallow in our commitment and that God is calling for an utterness that we have been unwilling to give. That's what martyrdom is. And that's the nature of, the God, of God, and it's the call of the, of the church. It is the faith. It's not some novel interpretation. It was God's intention for the first, this ultimacy toward God of the laying down of all. And so, uh, interestingly, that the same apostle who discerned the uh, deception was himself brought not long after, to a kind of deception by which he had to be nailed by Paul, about being one thing toward the, toward the Jews and another thing toward the Gentiles, and taking liberties with the truth and challenging the truth of the gospel itself, which for Paul he would not tolerate for a moment, but confronted him to his face. We need to come back again to the apostolic jealousy for the high calling of God, the standard of truth, of character, of conduct that uh, made the church an object of fear that people were afraid to join themselves to it. Which fear is today absent from the church because it has become a casual uh, uh, entity of yet another kind? Until we are restored to this, we cannot fulfill our own destiny. We cannot move Israel to its, its destiny. And so what was given at the first needs again to be fulfilled at the end. And, may, and the same God who brought these to their death is God still and jealous still 
and has been patient and has even winked in times past, but is now commanding all men everywhere, and especially the church, to repent for its shabby and sentimental and other alternatives to the call of God that requires a kind of personal ruthlessness to our own self-interest that alone makes the church the church and the thing to which we are called and alone by which Israel will be saved in a demon, in, in something that will bring her to jealousy. It's the cross. It's at the center of everything. It needs again to be embraced and be embraced willingly and joyfully. And for us to acknowledge that we have been playing games and that our present Christianity is to a very large extent a gamesmanship, a using of the vocabulary, a bringing in part, but with the withholding of the whole that makes a mock of the faith and allows the powers of the air to yawn in our faces at the very time that we're supposedly be taking uh, cities for Christ and in fact are taking nothing and leaving the Jews totally untouched by our very presence in their midst. So may we earnestly repent of this duplicity and play acting and seek the authentic thing to which we're called and for which we will be eternally grateful that we have fulfilled it in our lifetime rather than we should be shown in the day of eternity that we were only play actors, which hypocrite is the word for that, and went through a sham of pretense of going through only in part what we were unwilling to give in the whole and that our whole eternal destiny will reflect that uh, deviousness, that we will not look forward to the, joy, to, the, to the Lord's coming with a rejoicing, but with a shame that we have fallen short of the glory for which we were intended and can only be fulfilled by the church as the church, corporately, collectively, and together, encouraging one another, exhorting one another, rebuking one another, praying for one another, for surely this flies in the face of the world. The world is a soft soap. The world is an an enticement to take it easy and to be self-indulgent. You've got it coming. But the call of God is what he himself demonstrated at the cross. It's our call also. And we will be eternally grateful that we both heard the call and obeyed it for Jesus' sake. Isn't the church also uh, reflected in the attitude of the older brother in the prodigal son parable? The older brother was out in the field. He was doing his work, just like the church is. But if the older brother had joined with the father in looking out day after day, I can just imagine the father spent many days looking because it says in the scripture that when he saw the younger brother returning from afar, yeah. means he had to have been there. If the older brother had joined the father yearning, looking for the restoration, would he not have been in a, not in a sullen attitude, but more of a rejoicing attitude? And doesn't that reflect and expose a lot of where the church is at today? I think the remark of the father to the eldest son was, but everything that I have has always been yours. Until the church knows that, it cannot be to the erring and returning uh, profligate son what it ought. It will resent his return, as indeed there are strong pockets of resentment in the church toward Israel's restoration, because it does not know that it has from the father all things from the beginning. It needs to have that deep confidence that releases it to both the compassion of the Father and the joy of the return of the erring son of the uh, of erring Israel. And in fact, the issue of Israel will reveal where, in fact, where we are. The issue of Israel reveals who, in fact, the church is. And the first judgment of Jesus as king in separating sheep from goats at the end of the age is the one question, what did you do for the least of these, my brethren? If we're resentful, if we're jealous, if we're caught up in our own self-consideration, we cannot be to them what we ought. We will not see in that broken and hated and despised people the Lord himself. As you did it unto them, you did it unto me. And... Uh, those that both are able and are called righteous enter the kingdom prepared for us as his reward. Those who fail in this one thing fail in all and are cut out from that eternal privilege with a gnashing and a wailing of teeth and are cast out from the privileged um, relationship with the Lord and around the throne of his glory because we were unwilling to extend, unwilling to recognize, unwilling to express mercy to the least of these his brethren because they were not for us our brethren. <laughs>
as the Lord was not to us what he must be as Lord, neither can they be to us and the recognition that he gives them as his brethren while they're yet in a lost condition. And not only but recognizing, but, being, but extending to that people our uttermost as unto the Lord himself. Only the righteous can perform that. It's not an act. It's not a superficial accommodation. It springs out of the reality of God in the believer and in the church. And it is tested and revealed in the final and ultimate test that Israel in that condition alone provides through the nations. Our response to them is our response to the Lord. And our failure to make it is the indication that he never was to us what we had proclaimed him to be. And our failure to Israel uh, painfully uh, marks that failure and affects our eternal destiny. We're not going to come to this in a day if we do not consciously seek to come to these realities now. And it will be painful to come to our, through our play acting and to this ultimate thing. But through the exercise of the cross and the reality of its power, we will be in that day what God intends to the eternal joy of those who are rewarded with a kingdom prepared for us. May there be no failure in that day, no embarrassment, no shame at his coming, but an anticipation with joy that we have fulfilled our destiny and the evidence is that we are to the least of his brethren uh, what others are unable to be by the grace formed in us through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ himself. What will be the significance art for the nations when we have an Israel who's been restored from the dead? We have a church that has been transfigured by this whole process. We're on the very brink, so to speak, of the breaking into history of the theocratic kingdom of God. What will this mean for the nations and for I the world? I think we need to glimpse some measure of the glory that is future, and there's no man eloquent enough to convey it. But Paul said, if the falling away of them has been the riches of the Gentiles, what shall the return be but life from the dead? How can we understand that? Well, it's the establishment of the theocratic rule of God out of Zion, in which men will study war no more. And the enormous expenditures that go to violence and destruction will be at an end. And the things that we have always sought for the blessings of mankind can now be attended. But there's yet a dimension beyond that, as, as great, great as that is, in the phrase, a nation of priests and a light unto the world. The world does not know, and I don't think the church understands, that we are living in a disfigured world that is wanting uh, something of a kind that God himself has intended through Israel. What does it mean, a nation of priests and a light unto the world? Well, we know that the priests teach the difference between the sacred and the profane. For only the priests know it, and only the priests can proclaim it and demonstrate it in their priestliness. What has that meant for Israel's failure to fulfill its calling and destiny, but the profanation of the world and the things to which the world has given itself in its um, uh, 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 quest for gratification and lust, in its Sodom and Gomorrah mentality, in its abortions, in its incest, in its insanity, in its murders, and the kinds of things that are celebrated, even in our own culture, rap uh, music, and where the dialogues are so phenomenally filthy and degrading about women and are being listened to by middle class uh, white kids throughout the country to the tune of millions and billions that uh, enrich the coffers of these so-called artists and their musical companies too often headed up by our own Jewish kinsmen. That's the very evidence of the absence of a presence in the earth that God intended for all nations. It's not just the message that is spoken, it is a demonstration that is made. It's ultimate sanctity, priesthood, identification with, with man standing before them and before God and setting before them the richness of the law and the righteousness of God and the way to live. Until Israel will be restored to that calling, we will suffer an increasing deprivation, an increasing profanation, a corruption of life itself. And uh, we have lived so long in that condition that we count that as normative. And so God's cry is waiting for the fulfillment that he intended 
for Israel, to all nations, which will transfigure society and life and bring about that millennial blessing of righteousness and truth and beauty for which human beings were intended and for the want of which leads us to varicose veins and ulcers and broken marriages and, and uh, parentless children and all of the kinds of things that flood the, the world with institutions for the insane, the broken, the, the corrupted, and the defiled. We need to pray for the fulfillment of this mystery in the very material and rich reality that God intends and can only come through the mode and through which he has intended a nation as an example of himself to the world, a nation of priests and a light unto the world. We have been a false light through Marx, through Freud, through all of the other Jewish geniuses that have given us alternative Messiah-isms, but we need to, to set forth and proclaim the thing for which we're called in God, for which calling the church itself is our key. And I'd like to pray for that church, that it might come into its apostolic identity so as to bring us into ours, that all the earth might rejoice and that the praise of God might, might flow out from the uttermost corners of the earth to the God alone whose great wisdom and way this whole great design is. So Lord, I ask mercy for the church first. We have fallen so short of your glory, Lord, we have not understood the remarkable apostolic prophetic call which is ours. We have become something less and other. We have not disturbed or challenged our Jewish kinsmen, my God, in all the places where we are present in their midst. And so I ask, my God, an opening of our own understanding of how central our return to your purpose is for Israel coming into hers. And that there will be a people willing, my God, for the sacrifice to make up for the great loss. Surely, my God, we have been so negligent in this and have taken on such overtone and character that it's going to be a painful uh, rupture with our present mode of being. And there have to be people willing for it. So I pray, my God, for the church that your spirit the spirit of your life, the spirit of sacrifice, will come and touch it in its deeps, that you will restore the mystery of Israel and give us, my God, the vision for our identity that is so relative to them that we cannot even see nor understand what our call is as the church independently of them. Come, my God, use this modest effort that, that these uh, tapes uh, reflect and by your spirit, Lord, stir and bring into being what you have long waited that touches the issue not only of the world's delight and satisfaction and knowledge of you, but ultimately the glory of God forever. In Jesus' name, Lord, we ask it. Amen.